if we want the world to use the dollar as the world reserve currency, we, you know, the United States, we have to be careful about weaponizing the dollar, you know, because when you weaponize your money, uh, what happens to most weapons in a war? Well, they get blown up. You could throw them against the other guys and they, they shoot them down or they hit the target and they, they, they hit the target, but they still blow up. You know, you don't weaponize something, come out of a war and still have all your weapons. Hi, and welcome to the Wigan Sessions. I'm your host, Addison Wigan. Today I have with me Byron King. He's speaking to us from San Diego, where he's out doing some recon on different things in the global markets. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. We're going to talk about the impact of uh, the Russian invasion on Ukraine on commodities. Uh, obviously, natural gas and oil are being impacted. We Rare earths, uh, we'll get deep into rare earths because of the impact on all of the electronics that we're consuming and we're consuming right now. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, President Zelensky from, from Ukraine just addressed Congress one day before we're recording this session. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is part of the World Economic Forum. And that's a theme that we've been covering for some time here in the Wigan sessions. Um, he uh, addressed Congress and asked for a reset of the global institutions. Uh, they're already um, planning for a global reset of the banking system, and they're already um, underway resetting the meaning of NATO and the UN, and uh, they're trying to reset the political institutions as well. And Zelensky was calling for Congress to take action uh, and, and uh, provide uh, protection for peace-loving nations like Ukraine. So Byron, welcome. Uh, See, so you've got Thanks. the naval base behind you there. <laughs> naval base, that's <laughs> North that's Island, uh, San Diego. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it, I, I, I was stationed out here many, many years ago for no, for a number of years. And uh, so it's it's near and dear to my heart, Naval Air Station, North Island. Yeah. Why don't you tell, just tell me a little bit about your history with, uh, with the Navy, uh, just because uh, you have a neat uh, perspective on um, sort of the strategy of what NATO is up to right now. Uh, in response to the things that President Zelensky had uh, petitioned Congress about yesterday. So give us a little bit of background of, of your experience. You were uh, an aide to the Chief Naval Operations right. uh, Officer. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I went in the Navy a long time ago. I'll just, I'll just give the date. It was 1981, uh, and I was stationed out here at San Diego at North Island. I was in the anti-submarine warfare business chasing in those days, the Cold War Soviet submarines. So know a few things about Soviets and Soviet Union, Soviet submarines. Uh, know a lot about nuclear weapons, more than we can talk about here. And, uh, and then after that assignment, I worked on the staff of the Chief of Naval Operations in Washington. Uh, and I was in the International Programs Office. But, you know, I mean, I mean there's big staff there. But, uh, you know, I, I dealt extensively with, you know, NATO allies. I mean, I, I worked with, I worked on the Canada desk. I work with the Germany desk. I work with the Netherlands, Norway people. And so, you know, I know a lot about NATO from way back when, when NATO was NATO, you know, when it was like still, you know, the cold, the post-World War II NATO idea of defending against the Soviet Union. And the Soviets collapsed in the 1991. And then for the last 30 years, I mean, you know, if, if you're, if you followed the history, you know, what's gone on, you know, the U.S. has been this sort of unified unipower uh, kind of leading the charge around the world, doing whatever it wants. Uh, the uh, another way of looking at it is that the U.S. has gone around the world, you know, um, putting its will down, you know, where uh, where it, where it wanted to. Um, and we you can debate that all day. People write books on that, but you know, lots of continuous wars, lots of time in the Middle East as a as a reservist. I was I spent a lot of time in the Middle East, a couple of wars, you know, and um, uh, and then I've been writing with. You know, Agora Financial and, you know, the various iterations of that now for actually it's 15 years last month was my 15th anniversary. 15 on the payroll there. You've been signing my paycheck for 15 years. There. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and so uh, you, haven't, you haven't fired me yet. So, uh, so anyhow, and so here we are. So, you know, let's, let's jump into it. Uh, and uh, if I think I need to add any more color about my background, I will, but let, let's get to your questions because these are important. And I think the listeners and the viewers. Well, let's get, like, let's yeah. get right to, um, uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to decipher what is true and what is not true about 
the Russian motives for um, for invasion. They started the first original invasion was back in 2014. They got serious in 2015. They took over the Crimea Mm -hmm. and they've been um, helping the separatists ever since. And, you know, there's been rumors about uh, Russian troops training the separatists uh, since 2015. Um, and then as early as May of last year, they started lining up actual troops along the border. Um, and then we, we, we've discussed it on this, uh, on this program before that um, they were committed to an invasion um, as early as uh, December of 2020 or 2021. Um, mm-hmm. And it would have to have happened sometime um, in January or February. And it in fact did happen in February. Uh, one of the reasons that seems to be the popular narrative is that uh, they didn't want Ukraine to join NATO. Uh, there was a lot of overtures from the Zelensky government to do so. And then also there's uh, some question of control over the pipelines that go through Ukraine. They deliver natural gas to Germany. Um, so my question is really, what, what insight do you have on uh, Russian motives? I know we're already a couple weeks into the war. And a lot of that stuff's been picked over, but I wanted to ask your opinion on, on uh, what the motives are. And then also how what, it seems like Putin is ratcheting things up rather than, uh, than um, leaning towards a ceasefire, which they've been talking about. But, you know, they're actively shelling Kiev right now. And, uh, well, doesn't look like they're going, going away anytime soon. No, I, I mean, absent some sort of a miracle. You know, I, I don't. I don't see how this war ends soon or gracefully. Uh, when you say, you know, what were Russian motives? Um, now we can kind of get back into history, and I can tell you some personal history. And it yeah. goes back to the end of the Soviet Union. And I mentioned I was on the staff of the Chief of Naval Operations. This is in the late '80s, 1990, and the Soviet Union was falling apart. I mean, it, I mean, we didn't know it was going to collapse the way it did. Nobody knew that then. When I say nobody, nobody in the U.S. side knew that then. Um, Nobody who wrote an intelligence report that I saw knew that then. Let's just put it that way. Um, but towards the end, I remember this. I remember this because I was there. Uh, a couple of Soviet admirals came over to Washington, D.C., and they sat down with the American admirals. And it's sort of like, you know, admiral to admiral stuff. But I'm just sort of this junior officer in there, just kind of you know, listen there, take notes and keep my mouth shut, you know. And, and they're talking about, well, you know, we're, we've got to deconflict what's going on. You're America, you're all over the world. We Soviets, we're all over the world. We're going we're gonna to pull apart and we've got to make sure there's no misunderstandings. Yeah, that's sort of that big, big time stuff. Yeah. Okay. So one of the Americans at one point said something like, yeah, well, you know, was, you know they, they talked about how the Soviet Union had lost the Cold War. And the Soviet admiral says, excuse me, excuse, pardon me, sir, but uh, I don't look at it as one side won the Cold War, one side lost the Cold War. What's going on is that we in the Soviet Union have decided that this system is no longer appropriate to our, to our situation as Russia. And this was before everything broke apart, you know, all the stands and the Baltics and all that. He says, but he said, we, are be- we are beginning to transition to a different way of governance after 75 years of, uh, you know, of, of, of Bolshevik and communism. And Said, but don't look at don't look at it as you won and we lost because that's that's not the way to accept to understand what's happening. I was just sort of one of these little things you file away in the back of your head, you know. And then for years, for decades, we said, "Oh, in America, we won the Cold War. Reagan, he won the Cold yeah. War. You the know, end of history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the end of history." It's like, oh, that's maybe how we think about it, but that's not that's not how they think about it. That's not how the Russians think about it. They view it as, you know, the, 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 the communist system outlived itself. It was time to transition to something else. Nobody knew what the something else was going to be. But through a lot of internal turmoil, you know, the place collapsed and, you know, the governance of the place collapsed. Russia was still there. I mean, every day people would flip on this light switch and the electric power would come on and they turned the tap and the water would flow. And, you know, they had all sorts of economic problems in the 1990s. You know, if you recall, you know, the, the economic shock and everything, they there, there, a lot of Russians became very bitter about, oh, we thought you Americans were going to come in and, you know, really show us how to run an economy with, you know, with your big full grocery stores and your, you know, your cars and your roads and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we're, we're over here, we're over here. It's not, not working out for us, you know. And, uh, and in a sense, that's, that's why Putin showed up. You know, it's kind of like there was this minor, you know, I mean, we say he was a lieutenant colonel in the KGB stationed in Dresden, you know. 
everybody talks about, oh, he was a you know, big shot KGB guy. He's a lieutenant colonel. He's an 05. I mean, the world is filled with 05s, you know, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, well, he, you know, he might be a smart guy. Lots of smart guys are, you know, make 05 and everything else. But um, he, uh, he, but he managed to move his way up through the power structure, starting in Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg. Uh, and, you know, he, and he wound up uh, as the president in, in 1999, I guess. And, uh, and he, he's been sort of rebuilding his vision of Russia ever since. When I say his vision, Putin, it's, you know, you don't want to be careful about personalizing things that happen. You know, Putin, Putin, Putin. No, no, no. Putin, Putin, Putin represents a vast amount of the uh, intellectual thinking within sort of Russianness. You know, in inside of Russia, it's kind of like when people say, "Oh, Trump did this and Trump did that." No, Trump represented you know tens and tens of millions of Americans who wanted who didn't like what was going on with the border, didn't like deindustrializing the country. Trump didn't come out of nowhere. If Trump had come out and said, "Hi, I'm just your natural standard rhino Republican," you know, he'd, he'd be he'd still be selling real estate in New York, you know. So and and you know, but so we say Trump did this, Putin does that. Putin represents a very very deep um, ethic within you know, like you might call it the Russian soul, you know. So and that, you know, now now leap forward ahead. You know, what was the cause of the war? Well, I really do think that if the West, the U.S. and European powers had not just focused on this expand NATO, expand NATO, expand NATO thing, um, uh, I don't think we'd have a war. I mean, if we had said, you know, it's not so bad being Finland. Okay? It's not so bad being neutral Finland or neutral Austria. They didn't they didn't have such a bad time of it in the 60s, 70s and 80s as neutral powers during the Cold War. If we just said, Ukraine, you're a nice country, you know, we, we'd love to trade with you, we'd love to work with you and send your ballet dancers here and we'll send our rock bands there and, you know, we would have a great time, but you're not going to be NATO and we're not going to stick our missiles, you know, 250 miles from Moscow and stuff like that. If we had said that, I think we'd be living in a different world today. So, I mean, that it, people will write books on this, but that's sort of my, my view, my view from my view from San Diego right now this morning. Yeah. Well, they ratcheted up the rhetoric, or Putin did, when he was talking to the oligarchs, mm -hmm. uh, saying that he was going to take care of the situation, and, and he pushed it to the point where he had to invade. It sounded like, at least, you know, from the analysis that I've been able to to conjure mm -hmm. up. Um, and then the invasion started, and uh, I think even in the West, we were still shocked, like, is he really going to do it? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then now we're a couple weeks in, and uh, and it's getting worse and worse. Uh, let's move on, though, to let I, I want to um, tie tie NATO into uh, what I was talking about. President Zelensky saying we need to reboot or reset the political institutions um, that so that they can protect Ukraine. They want he wants a no fly zone over the country. Um, but he, it's also part of a larger conversation about resetting the economy as well. They want to reset the, the political institutions and the banking system so that they can have like a more unified market in, in Europe. And Ukraine was part of that, um, part of that movement. Um, and then also the, the United States was involved in that too. Um, and it's all sort of wrapped up in this concept of the great reset, uh, which I've been trying to get to the bottom of the, you know, Charles, uh, Klaus Schwab and uh, Charles Schwab, <laughs> Charles Schwab, <laughs> uh, Klaus Schwab and uh, Mark Carney and and his crew and um, like that whole uh, that whole Davos crowd. Uh, Zelensky is part of that, um, so it's hard to be uh, both critical of the Great Reset, the concept of the Great Reset, and you know, sort of allowing republics like the United States to um, develop independently of the global world order, and then also be supportive of, of the Ukrainian government after being invaded by Russia, like uh, intellectually, um, like uh, rationally, those two ideas are at odds with one another. Um, what do you make of his call for resetting? I think he was actually specifically calling for a reset of the idea of NATO. Um, but then also um, the UN, he, he was talking about restructuring the way that, that uh, what did he call them? The more, um, the more responsible nations uh, govern the rest of the world. 
Well, I mean, again, people, people write books on this. Um, there was a school of thought within NATO in the early 1990s that, well, the Cold War is over, the Soviet Union has collapsed, you know, what should we do with this NATO thing anymore? You know, should we, yeah. should we disband it? Should we alter its structure or whatever? But NATO had become such an entrenched bureaucratic uh, entity that, I mean, lots of jobs, lots of money, lots of, you know, lots of politicking about NATO, uh, you know, in, in terms of an, an, an alliance, you know, that it, 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 it just kept growing, you know, and then, but in through the nineties, they added new countries, you know, I mean, I remember uh, one of the first things that Poland wanted to do when the Soviets finally pulled their troops out, which was not right when the Soviet Union collapsed. I mean, it, it took a while to get all the Soviet Red Army installations out of Eastern Europe. I mean, they literally didn't have places to go in Russia. They had to build barracks for them so that the troops could have a place to go. Um, but when, as soon as the Russians were out, the Poles wanted to join NATO. And I remember people saying, oh, gee, it's going to be tough. I mean, everything about the Polish military is like Soviet. And, you know, we don't even have the right fuel nozzles to put fuel in their jets. You know, we, we wouldn't be in to know how to do it. But um, so a lot of people wanted, you know, a lot of countries wanted to get into NATO, you know, the, the Baltic states, they, want, they, they wanted that, and, you know, Poland, um, Czech Republic, uh, Romania. Um, it's really been a problematic issue over the years. You know, should we expand NATO or should we have dissolved it and called it something else? I mean, at one point, Vladimir Putin actually mentioned to Bill Clinton, I think it was 1990 or 2000 before Clinton left. He says, he said, do you think we would ever, you know, be able, we Russia would ever be able to join NATO, uh, thinking that this is a defense alliance. And um, uh, for, for some reasons, and it, it, these Washington, D.C. deep state kind of reasons, uh, it, it, never, it never worked out. You know, there was still all that legacy mistrust of Russia, 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 dating back into the Cold War and the Soviet Union. Uh, so, you know, the question of, you know, what do, what do we do with NATO? Well, you know, after you know, people accuse Trump of, you know, yo, you, 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 you damage NATO, you wrecking NATO and everything else. All Trump did, in my view, was sort of point out the fallacies of NATO, that we have countries in there that, you know, allegedly they are part of a defensive alliance, but they have no defense. You know, they, I mean, they, they, you know, 100 tanks in Germany that actually work, you know, a couple dozen combat airplanes that actually work, you know, Germany cut its army by two thirds after the end of the Cold War and did away with, you know, conscription, whatever. So, I mean, oh, there are big countries like Germany. I mean, it, it has a very weak military in many, many senses. So uh, what, what, what's going on right now as we speak, as the war rages in Ukraine, I mean, NATO is, has, has spooled up, you know, and, uh, um, but spooled up from a very, very weak industrial position, a very weak, uh, military power position, a very weak operational position. Uh, you know, I guess we're going to see if that legacy bureaucracy of NATO in Brussels is actually, you know, up to the task of, yeah. you know, regenerating an alliance, if we're going to wind up, you know, butting heads with Russia for the next, you know, generation yeah. or so. The, the deep uh, state of NATO. <laughs> say, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. The deep the, state of NATO. <laughs> the, there is a NATO, oh, there is an institutional yeah. NATO deep state. Don't worry about that. They, they have, um, they have their tentacles, not just in Washington, but, in, you know, in, you know, I mean, London and Berlin and, you know, they're, they're everywhere. Um, as far as, you know, as far as, you know, what to have done with Ukraine. And when I say what to have done, I'm using that kind of those odd, you know, um, you know, uh, subjunctive kind of things. Um, I mean, because Ukraine, as we know, it is over. I mean, it, it's I, I, I don't see part, I see parts of Ukraine breaking away. Uh, I don't see Crimea ever going back to Ukraine. I mean, it's historically Russian, and that gets deep into Russian history. Russians are never going to give you or give Crimea back, you know. Uh, uh, as it is right now, I mean, Russian military power controls the, most of the north coast of the Black Sea. Uh, good luck getting that back, you know, uh, if you're if you're Ukraine. Um, and uh, I mean, even if everything stopped tomorrow, if everything stopped this afternoon, tomorrow morning, bright and early, sun comes up, not a not a gun firing across the entire expanse of Ukraine. Um, the uh, Soviet combat power controls a part of Ukraine that's quite a bit larger, for, ex for example, geographically, than the entire island of Great Britain, England, Wales, Scotland. I mean, it, there are yeah. Soviet troops and Soviet tanks in an area the size of Great Britain. 
in that stretch of, of eastern Ukraine. Yeah. How things are going to resolve, you know, I mean, that's that's up in the air. But, there, you know, what's Ukraine going to look like on the other side? Well, you know, I, I mean, Zelensky has done a good job of, of uh, you know, showing his leadership qualities. Uh, and he is, he is, you know, he, he is the Western world's, um, I mean, people people talk about him like he's the new Churchill. I mean, we could get into discussion. Is he, is he a Churchill or, he, or is he? see something else, you know, but uh, yeah. um, man, when you read the mainstream news, you know, he's, he's great. You know, and he goes in front of Congress, he gives a speech, everybody gives him a standing ovation, you know, whoops. And he, uh, he's asking for a, he's asking for a no fly zone, which no fly zone, does that sort of imply that our jets will shoot down Russian jets and Russian anti-aircraft missiles or shoot down our guys? And isn't that what we call, you know, escalation, you know? Um, and, and I get it. I get the whole story. You know, well, Russian pilots flew MiGs in the Korean War against our guys and shot our guys down. And in Vietnam, the Russians provided, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of cargoes of ships of surface air missiles and MiGs. And, you know, the, the whole North Vietnamese, you know, combat effort was, you know, funded by, you know, mostly the Soviet Union. And those, I get it. I get it. You know, but, but uh, uh, you know, where, 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 do, where do we, the West, where do we, the United States, where do we want to go with this? You know, I mean, uh, um, I mean, again, the, the whole Ukraine story is a, is a, it's, it's a lot, there's a lot of deep history there. You know, I mean, there's, there's recent history, there's Soviet history, there's World War II, there's the World War I and post-World War I Bolshevik history, there's czarist history. I mean, um, Ukraine is this sort of cobbled together country. And, uh, you know, just when you, when you studied history in middle school and high school, and you saw the maps of Europe over the different hundred year periods, you know, the, the, the lines all moved all the time. This guy conquered that area, that guy conquered this area. Yeah. Else. I mean, we're, we're in one of those times when we're going to have to, you know, change all the maps, um, you know, uh, coming out of this. Yeah. Um, the, go, just going back to Trump real quick, mostly mm -hmm. what he wanted was for, uh, for the NATO countries to, to fund their own defense, right? Even if the U.S. was providing it, he was saying. Yeah, he asked them to live up to their agreement. Free. Yeah. Yeah, two two percent of your GDP, yeah. and uh, into your military, and 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 really in a Western military, a lot of the funding that goes into the military in a Western world uh, is for is for salaries and benefits and healthcare and stuff like that. Yeah. It's not like you're, you know, uh, and it's, it's not like you're you're buying a lot of, uh, uh, not like you're buying a lot of manpower, person power, uh, you know. Uh, with it because every every soldier every person in the military is a, is a high cost uh, entity uh, and and really when you get into the debates in like the Pentagon and in high places the debate is always about do we spend the money on people or do we spend the money on equipment because you know if you have a whole lot of people you don't have a whole lot of money for all this expensive equipment you know like, like behind me we see these helicopters at North Island I mean every one of those you know uh, H60 helicopters every one of those things you know, 60, 80 million bucks, you throw some more electronics in it, you know, you can, you can have a hundred million dollar helicopter, you know, so it's, a, whoa, that's a lot, of, that's a lot of money, you know, for yeah, one helicopter. And, that, and that's some uh, big corporations making a lot of money too. <laughs> oh, the usual names, you know, we, yeah. we know the names, you know. We do. All right. So uh, the war rages on, we, we, we're expecting that to happen for some time. And in the meantime, there's uh, sanctions. So I'd like to uh, get your opinion on, how the sanctions work, um, and then also the disruptions in uh, oil. Like we we have uh, banned uh, oil, Russian oil support uh, um, imports. Uh, imports, sorry, and uh, we have have also disruptions in actual supply chains with um, uh, supplying fuel and different you know natural gas to European countries. Um, but let's take up. Uh, Sanctions first. I have been writing about it, saying that sanctions are a good idea because um, the it at least we're doing something. We're not putting troops on the ground, but at least we're um, trying to counter the invasion itself by limiting. Um, you know, we're freezing assets. We're taking yachts. We're doing all that kind of stuff. But but the real truth is that that sanctions um, they hurt more than just the oligarchs, they hurt average everyday Russians who have nothing to do with this conflict. They, they hurt uh, Americans <laughs> because we're all, we're seeing prices rise. They were already rising because of different um, economic trends that are underway. We'll get into those in a bit too, but 
Um, but the sanctions are just making everything worse, uh, economically speaking, and they don't seem to have any impact on the war whatsoever. So it's kind of like uh, the narrative is, oh, we got to punish those Russians, those bad, big, bad oligarchs. We're going to take all their stuff. But at the same time, the people that really pay the price are um, ordinary citizens of Russia, Europe, America. Um, and, and, and across I, the world. I don't have a, a mental framework to understand uh, the entire financial warfare aspect. Uh, Jim Rickards was just talking about this uh, earlier this week, mm -hmm. that one of the major losers in the financial war is China. Um, everyone was expecting them to kind of sit on the sidelines and watch the Russians in the West go, go at it and China would rise. Um, but a, a large chunk of their banks have, um, you know, they're, they're leveraged in the commodities markets and uh, they're hitting margin calls. And it's taking down some of the larger Chinese banks because uh, because of these disruptions in the commodities markets. Um, so I, I just wonder what happens, especially where the world is over indebted and we had all these issues prior to a hot war. What happens when we start slapping sanctions around? Is it going to have the same effect of uh, tariffs in in the 30s when we, you know, the Smoot Holly Act? kick this over into a real deep depression? Do you feel like that's something that's possible? It feels like we're headed in that direction. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're on a really, uh, it's, it's quite a dilemma to be running the United States monetary system I and mean, to be the Federal Reserve, to be Congress, to be the Treasury Department. Um, because, you know, if we want the world to use the dollar as the world reserve currency, we, you know, the United States, we have to be careful about weaponizing the dollar, you know, because when you weaponize your money, uh, what happens to most weapons in a war? Well, they get blown up. You could throw them against the other guys and they, they shoot them down or they hit the target and they, they, they hit the target, but they still blow up. You know, uh, you don't come out, uh, you don't weaponize something, come out of a war and still have all your weapons. You know, you have, you, you've blown them up. I mean, that's almost the definition of a weapon. And so, uh, and so when we, when we shut down within a matter of days and weeks, when we just isolate Ru Russia, allegedly isolate Russia, you know, from the global economy, um, you know, as you mentioned, you know, lots of impacts inside Russia, lots of impact outside Russia. And it's not just, you know, in Europe and America. I mean, everybody around the world is paying higher prices for gasoline. If you're a farmer in Brazil, you're paying more for your diesel fuel. If you're, you know, if you're a, a wheat farmer in Australia, you know, you're paying more for your fuel. Um, we, uh, it, and the thing is that we're not even, we're not, we're not eliminating the commodities. I mean, the oil is still there. The oil wells in Russia are still there. They just have to sell their oil now at a discount. And so you've disrupted entire markets because you get somebody, you get people like, oh, the government of India, for example, that abstain from, you know, voting against uh, Russia in the United Nations. Well, India is, you know, as a big, for a big chunk of India's military is Russian equipment, so they're not about to isolate themselves from Russia on that. India, India buys lots of oil, and uh, the in, in India has basically made no bones about it. If they're going to offer us a thirty dollar a, a barrel discount for oil, we'll buy their oil instead of yours. So, so Russian oil is still moving around the world. I mean, they'll just trade it through different trading vehicles. Uh, the, the oil will be there, but you know, uh, there there. But other oil will go someplace else. You know, China will buy less oil from Saudi, more oil from Russia. You know, uh, and and it, it gets into that China Russia relationship. I mean, what does China need? You know, China needs energy, and China needs minerals, materials. You know, basic resources for its economy. Um, the the Russians are you know they've, they've built they've built a couple of pipelines from Russia into China, and they're building more. One's called the Power of Siberia, number one, Power of Siberia, number two. Massive, big, you know, 48-inch pipelines uh, to send uh, natural gas to, uh, to China. Uh, and, and China will use every molecule of it for either to power the country or, or as feedstock for their chemicals industry. So um, when, when we sanction Russia, you know, are we, you know, we're, we're, we're using the dollar as a weapon, and the, we're weaponizing our money and we're destroying it in a sense, because that's what weapons do. They destroy things and blow themselves up. But are we really going to come out with this with the same uh, 
with the, with the, with the result we want. You know, what's the theory of victory here? You know, that's what the question we used to ask at the Naval War College. What's our, what's our theory of victory here? Uh, you know, we've, we've definitely isolated Russia, uh, but at the same time, we've, you know, to the extent that Russia was merging its strategic interests with China, that's still happening. Now it's really happening. Uh, and uh, we can say, well, it's, you know, it's bad for the Chinese because their banks are tied off. But China's more than capable of setting up two different uh, economic systems inside itself. There'll be the, there'll be the China-Russia economic system uh, that, that will work on, you know, trading rubles and yuan. And there'll be the China Western system, which the people will be able to say, we have nothing to do with what's going on over there. That's uh, we, we've got nothing. It's not not our bank, not my problem. And there'll be some banks that go under. And uh, uh, but uh, but I, I don't think uh, I, I don't think that, uh, that that we're going to see the kind of success with sanctions as we want to see. And meanwhile, the blowback to the West is things that you see already. I mean, you know, we saw our one hundred and thirty dollar oil, although, yes, the Price of oil has come down in the last you know week or so, last four or five days. Um, we you know we've seen prices of nickel explode, natural gas. I mean, holy smokes, you know. I mean, just even even here in the United States, uh, natural gas prices are going up. I mean, just look at your home heating bill if you heat on natural gas. You know, I know I know it's true with me. Um, and uh, and listen to what the farmers are saying about you know the price of fertilizer and price of herbicide and, fe- and pesticide, all of which is made from natural gas all of which will affect food prices. So, so all these sanctions that people are feeling really good about right now, you know, are going to come back and bite us, you know, on the hind end. Uh, I, you know, it's starting now, but I mean, I, I, I don't see it getting better as time goes on. I, th- I think it's going to get worse. It's going to contribute to inflation. What is the theory of victory um, by weaponizing the dollar? The theory of victory that I think you know, the, on, you know, from the American or the Western side is we're going to put these financial squeezes on you and we're going to we're going to we're going to shut your people off at the at the popular populist end from the things that they're that they're used to. You know, the Western goods that they buy in their stores and everything and that'll make them mad. We're going to eliminate the value of their savings because we're going to drop the value of the ruble and what have you. OK, um, uh, there's a huge effort. We're going after your oligarchs and. You know, there's this theory that, that Putin is a creature of his oligarchs, which uh, there's there's probably something to be said for that. I mean, but but, uh, you know, Putin has his own sort of internal security apparatus. And when when the oligarchs get out of hand, he just, you know, call, you know, you know, he brings them in on a tax charge and sends them off to prison for 10 years or something. But uh, we're going to put the pressure on your oligarchs um, and uh, Putin. We're going to take away, you know, all that money that you allegedly have in these different bank accounts all over the world. And the idea is going to be that we're going to take things away from you, from you and your rich buddies, and you're not going to like it. And so you're going to change your behavior. Um, all I can say is that, you know, have we ever truly changed somebody's behavior, you know, with sanctions that you know, who, who, who didn't want to change anyhow? Have we changed Cuba over the last 70 years, 60 years with, you know, sanctions? Um, you know, have we changed North Korea with sanctions, you know? Uh, I, there, I guess you could say that South Africa is, a, is an example of successful sanctions, but South Africa was already transforming out of its apartheid system um, in the, all, you know, all, already by the 1980s. I think people in South Africa would tell you that they, they realized that, oh, geez, you know, we, we really screwed up with this apartheid and we've got to find a way out. And it was only, you know, de Klerk and Mandela who sort of you know, managed to, you know, keep the place from, you know, from erupting. But, uh, but you know, so so. You know, can we uh, can we can we sanction our way to victory here? I suppose people think we can. I mean, my my view as a as an outsider, not a deep state or whatever, is you know is uh, I I think we're going to hurt a lot of people along the way, and I think we're going to damage the dollar. And just in the last day or two, you probably saw this that the news reports that China is talking with Saudi about selling oil in yuan versus dollars. You know, trading oil for for Chinese currency versus American currency. And, you know, OK, here we are. We're almost we're well, last August, just a few months ago, was the 50th anniversary of Nixon closing the gold window. We've talked about that many, many times. Um, and uh, it was I think it was about 1974, early 74, right after the Yom Kippur War, Kissinger and Nixon and uh, the Saudis came to this deal of you know pricing oil in dollars, the petrodollar. Yeah. Um, and, you know, th- that was a really great system. 
for the people who run American dollars for the last 51 years, uh, 50 years. But um, if, uh, if, 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 it's, if it's all starting to drift away, uh, that's the crack in the dam. Hello, you know, you know what happens when, when, you, get, when you see a crack in the dam, you know, don't, don't, be, don't be downhill from that water, you know, so yeah. we'll, we'll, see, we'll see where this goes. We'll see, I mean, right, right well, now, the, right now I, I, in my view, Biden and his, his team, their biggest problem is not, you know, how many more Javelin missiles are we going to send Ukraine? Their biggest problem is, what are we going to do if the dam breaks on the petrodollar, you know, what are we going to, what are we going to do if, if, uh, if the dollar begins to lose its reserve currency status, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to have, we're going to have two worlds. We're going to have the Western world of the dollar. And we're going to have this sort of world Island world, you know, this Hal, Halford McKinder world Island, Eurasia world of Russia, China, and all the satrapies that, you know, sort of decide to go along with them. Russia, throw India in there, Russia, China, India, um, you know, do do the math. That's 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 over half the world's population, a big yeah. whack of the world's GDP. What chances do you give the uh, Saudis going along with um, pricing or selling uh, oil in the yuan? Sounds like a pretty complex <laughs> uh, negotiation well, right there, too. Yeah, I, I mean, it could be that they're just sort of leaking this idea just to get some attention. You know, uh, you know, the Saudis are uh, the, the Saudis' big issue. I think with the United States is, is how um, we are handling and or mishandling the situation with Iran. I mean, there's no love lost between the Iranians and the Saudis uh, for many, many reasons. But I don't I don't think that the Saudis are looking forward to Iran, uh, you know, through some sort of a deal, you know, the JCPOA deal that everybody calls it, uh, you know, coming back into the world as a full trading partner, as an exporting uh, oil exporting power and, and you know, and the, kind of that, that Iranian, uh, that Iranian approach to dealing with the world, uh, you know, sort of the, the, with their mullahs and their crazy ideas, you know, we think they're crazy. The mullahs think, mullahs think that they're perfectly rational, I suppose. But uh, um, so perhaps the Saudis are just sort of throwing this out here as if, as if to say, you know, uh, we can, we, we can change this petrodollar arrangement any day now. Uh, if, if we don't get some love and attention from you people in Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what that takes. You know, at the same time, if I'm if I'm China, I'm more than happy to I'll, you send me boatloads of oil. I'll send you boatloads of yuan and uh, you can sell, you know, spend all the yuan back here in China. I'll build you a I'll build you a petrochemical plant. I'll build you a semiconductor plant. I'll build you a, a plant that makes missiles. I'll, I'll, this is at the China, this is part of the Chinese Belt and Road. You know, I mean, if I. If I have if if I if I buy your stuff and I give you yuan, you're going to give me my yuan back, and I'm going to belt and road you. Uh, I'll build your roads and your railroads and your airports, and I'll sell you all my 5G elect, uh, electronics. And um, you know, work, works for me, says China. So it's possible that uh, sanctions could just speed up the process that's already underway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, we're, we're, because you know, you have, you have, when you say process. That's the right word because we're in a process. I mean, this is today. This is the, the day that we speak. But I mean, there's there's decades of history behind this. You know, decades of history, including American deindustrialization. You know, closing the factories, closing, um, you know, closing the mines and the mills. I mean, and it, sort of a, a whole changed American ethic towards you know what is what is an economy. I mean, you know, you try to you try to open a oh, try opening a, uh, a a mine for almost anything in America. I mean, good luck. I mean, Arizona, Nevada, you know, Montana. Yeah, maybe. I mean, just right before, just the, literally the day before uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it was February 23rd, um, the Biden administration filed a lawsuit in Anchorage, Alaska, opposing uh, an access road to one of the best copper, uh, nickel, cobalt, gold, silver deposits, you know, in the United States of America, the the Ambler Mine, run by a company called uh, Trilogy uh, uh, Trilogy Resources, and uh, uh, I, I've been there. I've seen it. I, I know the people who've been developing it for you know ten or twelve years. I mean, uh, you, you know, in fact, in fact as, as an Agora writer, you, you bought me some airline tickets to go up there and, and kick the rocks there a couple times. Um, and so, but but literally the day before it happened, one of the highest grade, one of the largest copper deposits, you know, in uh, in America was essentially blocked for however long it takes to resolve litigation by the Biden administration. I mean, that's truly just, that's truly a marker of, 
how hard it is to get anything done. And people say, well, you should build your mine somewhere else. You only build the mine where the deposit is, okay? They've been working with the local uh, Alaskan Native corporations. They've been, doing, they've been doing everything they're supposed to do. They, they, they filed all their environmental permits. They read through, you know, 60,000 comments on it and, you know, responded to everything. You know, they, they got their permits from the Corps of Engineers and everybody. And the Biden administration goes into block it just because, well, we don't like mining. Well, okay, we don't like mining. You know, what do we like? You know, because we don't like oil development e either, according to the Biden administration. We, we want electric cars, but no copper. And, but we, and we don't like automobiles that run on gasoline, so we're not going to drill for oil either. I mean, what is, what is their theory of victory? I mean, good luck with that. Um, I want to ask one more question about the we weaponization of the dollar and then move into this the idea of the disruption in, in the precious metals market, the, mm -hmm. the industrial metals market, and also uh, rare earths, because I think that's really important to this whole movement towards uh, climate change initiatives and green energy and, um, and also the way that we're, uh, the, the Biden administration, I guess their theory of victory in, uh, in reducing carbon emissions. Um, I, I do want to get into that, but uh, first I want to ask one more question about weaponization of the dollar. Uh, when we were doing research way back when for Empire of Debt, I did a whole sort of historical look at um, how the pound, which was the reserve currency of the world under the gold standard uh, during Victoria times, uh, it was a 70 year period of, of relative world peace and uh, the pound was backed by gold. Mm -hmm. And uh, that all fell apart in 1913 when um, most of the countries in Europe realized they couldn't fight a war which was impending on the gold standard because you can't float, um, you can't, the, the balance of payments doesn't allow that if you have to back it, all of your you know, armament building and all that kind of stuff on the gold standard. So that, well, that was the first uh, crack in the dam for the, uh, for the pound. Um, but then it took, you know, another 20 years later, it took the second world war for the, for the pound to finally give way as the reserve currency of the world. And at Bretton Woods, they, you know, the, all the nations represented, I think there were 45 nations or something, um, uh, elected to make the dollar the reserve currency, which it has been uh, till now. But the point I, or sort of the major narrative that, that I uh, drew from doing all that research was that uh, it took two world wars for the reserve currency to, to change hands from, uh, from the British pound to the US dollar. And both of those currencies are relatively, um, uh, um, global, um, national currencies. Um, they both, even the pound today is accepted in most places. Um, the, the cracks in the dam right now are for the dollar to cede to the one. I remember writing about this, even in, uh, uh, demise of the dollar that historically speaking, the trend would be for the dollar to give way to the one as the world, uh, the reserve currency of the world. And that sound, I mean, that's inflammatory to a lot of people in the West, but um, that, that tends to be what happens. The rising uh, economies, the economies that are growing the fastest, uh, they, they want to trade in their own currency. And, and this example that you give of, of Chinese uh, asking Saudi Arabia uh, uh, to, to price their oil in one, it would mm -hmm. just be an example of I mean, it takes a long period of time. It took, what, 40 years for the, the pound to give way to the dollar. Um, we could be in that, the beginning stages of the, of the, um, the dollar giving way to the, the yuan. Jim Rickards is always saying that he thinks that we would never accept the yuan as the reserve currency. It would be more something like the SDRs that the, um, mm -hmm. that the IMF is pr proposing to, for settlements between nations. Um, but I think economic history has a way of outing itself, and um, it depends on what general, you know, the general population will accept as the, the reserve currency. Um, so I'm just fascinated by this idea of weaponization of the of the dollar because we behind that is a is a huge amount of hubris that we can just get away with it. <laughs> but if there if there are uh, it's kind of like the movie Jurassic Park where um, who's it Jeff Globum says. Life has a way. 
I feel like that's the way economics works too, is that like, if there's ways for people to get around the sanctions and use alternate, alternate currencies, then the hubris behind the dollar is, is, uh, is sort of planting the seeds of its own eventual demise. I'm not saying that we're going to have it right away, but a hot war in Ukraine is a, is a, is a, has a way, actually the pandemic first, and now this hot war has a way of kind of like ushering the trends in history into overdrive. Oh yeah, not, nothing happens just, you know, at the snap of a finger. Uh, I think things happen by, is the word we've used before, by, by processes, processes of history. When you talk about, you know, the dollar, the power of the dollar, you know, the, the power of the American monetary system, I mean, the monetary system has its power as a, as, a, as a derivative, you might say, of America's just general military power. I mean, no, we mentioned Bretton Woods, you know, July 1944. You know, what was going on then? Well, the, you know, the war in Europe was raging. The war in Asia was raging. And, and it looked like, you know, the, the, the allies were going to win. And in fact, I'll get back. The, when you say who 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 was there at Bretton Woods, there was a Soviet delegation there at, at Bretton Woods. They did not um, they did not formally join the Bretton Woods Agreement, but Stalin sent his people, uh, very smart people, to Bretton Woods to to keep an eye on things and you know what, what's going on with this. And they didn't come out and oppose using the dollar as a as the global uh, currency. You know when the war was over, they didn't oppose it. Um, because they, they they sort of understood that yeah it's, it's this is probably something we can live with and and, and we'll work with this um, and meanwhile the United States way back then had something like over ten thousand tons of gold you know in its in its reserves I mean this was before we started distributing gold you know in the forties and fifties and sixties uh, you know just get, get it, getting it out of Fort Knox uh, but the other thing about economic power or the, or the military, but military power is derivative of economic power and, you know, basically your ability to produce things. And so, you know, if you can, you can fault China for a lot of things, but uh, one thing that they've done in the last, you know, pick a number, 30, 40 years, is they have truly developed their economic power. I mean, you know, a billion tons of steel per year. I mean, the United States produces like 70 million tons of steel. I mean, you know, 13, 14 times as much steel in China gets produced as in uh, as in, as in the U.S. And just one little factoid, a little cool little thing since I'm in San Diego. China uses more steel every year in its shipbuilding industry, building tankers and freighters and military. They use more steel every year to build ships than the United States produces steel. You know, I think about that, you know, so, uh, wow. You know, so, so China is a massive economic power. And what history tells you, whether it's Britain, the United States, and whatever comes, um, that, that, that military power is derivative of economic power, your ability to produce things that, you know, that give you, you know, international clout. And then, you know, and then the monetary power comes along. I, 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 you, know, you and I and Jim, and Jim Rickards, we have had discussions like this before over many, many years that we've been working with Jim Rickards. I don't, I'm not going to put, you know, uh, words in his mouth. He does a great job of explaining, you know, where he's coming from. I think the Chinese might be a little bit, wary, might be wary of the yuan itself being the world's reserve currency, because that puts all the onus back on China. I do like Jim's idea of like these special drawing rights, but it's not going to be a special drawing right controlled by the people in the Federal Reserve in, on Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C. Those guys, those guys are, are rapidly fading from the picture. You know, the, the, the SDR of the future is going to, you know, it's going to dollars, euros, yen, yuan, uh, a commodity angle, maybe ags or maybe petroleum, something like that, you know. Uh, but there's going to be some sort of a, of a unit, a unit of account that people will use for international trade. And then, um, you know, every three months, every quarter, every six months or something, you know, they'll kind of get together and settle the accounts or whatever, and, and they will see who the winners are and who the losers are. Is uh, the uh, crypto playing a role in that? Like, say, just Bitcoin as a proxy for all uh, cryptocurrencies? Yeah, well, well, crypt, you know, crypto, uh, crypto is still evolving. Uh, I, I, I don't see crypto becoming part of of an SDR type entity in and of itself. But I do, I do see, I do see sort of a crypto version of an of an SDR. You know, uh, as it as it evolves. Um, the uh, uh, 
there, there, with, with crypto, you, the big problem with crypto is, is not that there's not crypto, there's lots of cryptos, but it's that there's no sort of international credit system for cryptos. You know, if, I mean, if I buy a tanker load of oil, the oil's in Saudi Arabia and I'm right now in San Diego, California, and I say, I want that tanker of oil over here. Okay, it's going to take, you know, 45 days or something like that. I mean, there's a lot of credit involved in this. You know, I mean, I'm, I've, got to, I've got to borrow money. I've got to, you know, put the money over there. They're, you know, they load the tanker, the tanker sales. And there's all, there's all this risk involved. There's insurance. There's a lot of moving parts to international trade. And crypto right now does not have, I would say, the depth of credit and the depth of, of insurance of the value. You know, like if I have a tanker full of oil, I have insurance on the tanker and I have insurance on the oil in case it hits a rock along the way and sinks in the middle of the ocean, that kind of a thing. Um, you know, it, it, it was kind of like futures markets. You know, I mean, where did futures markets came from? Well, back in the days when London controlled everything, if somebody had a cargo of tea in Malaysia and it was sailing, you know, going to take 90 days to sail halfway around the world. OK, well, I'll, I'll buy the tea, which is in Malaysia, but the ship has to get here. So so that's where the kind of the futures markets came from. And uh, um you know, so we, we don't see that with crypto yet. I, I, crypto is still a very unevolved idea. It's a, it's a lot of, it's very interesting and, it, and a lot of people are having a great time with it. And some people have made money and some people have lost a lot of money. And we're coming up with these incredible ideas that all rely on, you know, on, on software and computing power to make it all work. Um, but, uh, but crypto is not ready to displace uh, other things to, to make world trade happen. Um, let's let's get back to the uh, to the disruption in um, in the commodities markets because mm-hmm. uh, and I'm, I would like to tie it into um, this idea of let them drive Teslas. Um, <laughs> I think it was a uh, AOC. Um, yeah. yeah, really, really. Are I you think just- she had said that because she's like, well, if they, you know, if if gas prices get high enough, everybody can drive electric cars. It just seems like an odd. Uh, an odd response, a very political response, but but um, I also saw a sixty minutes report uh, with Pete Buttigieg, who was saying that he was talking about the uh, application. He's he's the guy that signs the checks for the infrastructure bill, mm-hmm. and he gets to decide whether it's uh, climate friendly or not. There, a lot of it's going to bridges and roads and that kind of thing, but he also has allocated um, a, a big chunk of it. Um, it's allocated in the bill to go towards things like um, uh, uh, aiding the development of the electric car business. I think they're mm-hmm. they're uh, they're going to fund through this bill. They're going to fund electric charging stations throughout the nation so that you can get from one place to the other and charge your car up and that kind of thing. So it's a kind of a political initiative baked into the infrastructure, um, but but inherent in that is the demand for things that you were talking about. That they're not allowing to be mined in uh, mm-hmm. in uh, in Alaska, and also a lot of the like the nickel and the titanium and a lot of the things that go into electric cars or uh, computers or iPhones, rare earths. Uh, I know we, you, and I have had conversations about rare earths that would pretty much put anyone on the planet to sleep. <laughs> but we're both fascinated by the idea that you need these rare earths to. Uh, to build all of the, the tiny little uh, components of electronics that we demand, I mean, we rely on for the economy these days. Um, A lot of that comes from Russia and um, China and countries that are not necessarily economically aligned with us and um, except as trade partners. And if you disrupt the the trade, then, uh, I, I, got, I just wonder what's going to happen over the long run. Those prices for those things are going to go through the roof. And also, I'd like to add to that, uh, between the Ukraine and uh, Russia, they produce 30, if you combine the two, 30% of the world's wheat. Mm-hmm. So um, wheat is in everything. Wheat and oil are in everything. All of our packaging, all of our processed foods, they either have oil in the packaging or they have wheat in the, uh, you know, the gluten that sticks everything together. All of that's being disrupted now to, to a global extent. And that is on top of uh, rising inflation before the war even began. 
supply chain issues that came up uh, about because of the pandemic, um, th there's like a perfect storm of, of, uh, of issues that are going on just with the raw materials that we need to make things. And then you throw in on top of that, the Fed is uh, just signaled, they just raised rates and they're signaled they're going to do it six more times this year to, to curb inflation. I mean, there are serious headwinds against, uh, against a thriving economy right now. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, infl inflation is bad and, you know, on a 0.25% basis increase is not, you know, it's, it's not really, you know, throwing down the gauntlet and saying this is good, this is going to stop inflation right here, right now, you know, uh, at the same time, you know, you raise interest rates too much, you know, you, you, you'll, you'll crash the economy, crash the stock market, what have you, um, you know, po politics and monetary theory are, uh, are, are deeply entwined. Um, at the at the root of everything is some sort of production, you know, whether it's oil from a well or natural gas or whether it's wheat from the ground. And when you say wheat from the ground, it's wheat from the ground that's produced by diesel fuel, fertilizer, herbicide, pesticide, you know, processing, energy intensive processing uh, and everything else. I mean, you know, when, when you when you go to the bakery to buy a loaf of bread, there's an there's an awful lot of oil and gas, you know, inside that loaf of bread that you take home from from the bakery, and you know we could say that about any about everything else. Uh, you know, you start out talking about you know let them let them drive Teslas or let them drive electric cars. You know that 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 that's that's their pipe dream. Um, it's such interesting that you know like when President Biden you know talks about automakers, he talks about GM and Ford. He never talks about Tesla. Uh, I guess because you know Tesla's politically on the outs. They don't have a they don't have an they don't have a labor union representing their workers or something, but. Uh, when we talk about we're going to save the planet and save the environment with our environmental, you know, with our with our electric cars. Well, news for you, well, newsflash, you know this, Addison, but, you know, the copper mining, the lithium mining, the nickel mining, the rare earth mining. And it's not just mining. It's the production It is all, you know, just it, it disturbs the environment somewhere. It's all energy intensive somehow, whether it's the big you know, bulldozers that move the rock or the explosives that blast the rock or the crushers and the processing and everything else that goes into it. It can be done in an environmentally correct way. Obviously, I've been to I've, I've been everywhere. I've been to six out of seven continents. And, you know, I, uh, I've seen a lot of things, but I have not seen a Western mining company engaging in, you know, intentionally bad practices. I mean, I, they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're, very few companies have a vice president in charge of going to jail you know, for, for, you know, for shit, for cutting corners on environmental um, matters. Uh, globalism is one of those things that, you know, where the West has basically uh, painted itself into a corner by saying, you know, we're going to, we're going to feel good about ourselves. We're going to be very environmentally conscious. We're going to have all these great, you know, mining laws. And beyond that, we're going to develop this, not just mining laws about, you know, controlling things and doing it correctly, but we're anti-mining on everything. No mines in Alaska, no mines in Minnesota, no, you know, you know, no, no, no mines anywhere, you know, no drilling, all that kind of stuff. We feel real good about it only because, you know, when some, for some strange reason, when we write a check to somebody uh, overseas, they send us that tanker of oil or they send us that cargo of copper or they send us the rare earths that, that we need or they send us the components, you know, the little magnet systems that go into the drivetrain of a, an electric car that have the rare earths in them that came from some mine in China. Um, and so, uh, you know, when we talk about we're saving the environment, it, we're not really saving the environment because the environment is being sacrificed someplace, somewhere else. You know, when you when you think about the windmills and the solar panels and all that, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the cognitive dissonance that is going on within, you know, like the Western ethic and certainly the Western environmental ethic is staggering uh, in that regard. Uh, can we get ourselves out of it? Well, I mean, I, I mean, my beat for the last, you know, many, many years with Agora and with the various newsletters I've written has been, you know, resource development. I've, you know, I've mm -hmm. been to dozens, you know, hundreds really of, of mining projects and whatever, uh, you know, and like I, I, the third time I've said this, you know this because you, you signed the checks for me to, you know, to go there uh, when, when you were, you know, when you were the publisher there. And uh, um yeah, you know, there, there's 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 copper to be mined and nickel, and there's rare earth deposits and that yeah. are developable. And but you know, it's it's a whole it's a whole process of you know, it's not just a science experiment to go out in the woods and say, oh look, a brown stain on the rock. Oh look, this look at this really interesting you know chunk of rock up here, this 
carbonatite. Oh, wow, isn't that interesting? Well, you forgot to turn that carbonatite into, you know, something that goes into your into your into your iPhone or something or you know, whatever. Can't see it. But uh, um, if you're going to turn that into into the materials that you need, um, the uh, you're, you're going to have to uh, allow industrial development to happen, and that that means you're going to you're going to disturb land. You're going to build buildings. You're going to uh, have industrial processes. You're going to use energy. You're, God forbid, you're going to have to train people how to do this at universities. You know, they're going to have to have fewer gender studies majors and more, you know, chemical engineering majors. And, and uh, oh, gee, chemical engineering, that's hard. So, you know, we don't, we, you know, we don't know if we want to do that. It's, it's, there, there's a, there's a strange ethic at work in the whole, uh, in the whole Western psyche at this point. What, um, what chance you give, uh, let's say that all of these economic forces uh, sort of, I'm reasonably confident that we're headed for a pretty serious recession anyway, uh, because I think the Fed waited too long to start raising rates to curb inflation. And that's going to, you know, people are going to drive less. It's going to cost trucking more. There's going to be a lot of uh, drags on the economy just from rising prices. And then you add in these supply chain issues and sanctions and all that, uh, I, we're headed for some serious economic challenges. What chance do you give those economic challenges uh, a wake-up call for the, the ethics that you're talking about? I mean, it's one thing to feel good about ourselves, but when we can't, can't drive our cars and use our electronics anymore, can't stream on Netflix, um, I have a feeling that sort of mirage of Western uh, prosperity <laughs> dissipates pretty quickly. Oh, I think, it, I, I, I think that a recession is already, you know, kind of cooked into the books. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, when you look at the price of energy, I mean, you know, considering what, what you pay for a gallon of diesel, I mean, uh, you know, you or I may not drive a diesel car, but I mean, if you go to the store and you buy something, you know, whether, you know, food, clothing, shoes, you know, whatever, you know, uh, all, all of that stuff, you know, got to the store by diesel fuel, or you say, well, I don't go to the store. I shop on Amazon. Okay, great. The Amazon truck, you know, shows up and it runs on diesel. Yeah. But, um, you know, or the, the airplane that flew it from China to the distribution center in Kentucky and then brought it to your house, or the, that, run, that runs on kerosene or diesel, you know. So uh, the, the, the price of energy has gone, you know, very, very high in the last, you know, last year and a half, certainly in the last two months, three months, you know, um, and, and that will affect everything. And, and so, so the high prices and the inflation is cooked into the books. Uh, strangely, we don't see it in the price of gold because, you know, you know, gold is not manipulated as they say. Yeah. Right. Um, but we, but we see it everywhere else. And so, uh, you know, if you haven't figured out yet that we're about to go into a recession, you should. Uh, and, uh, because it's, it's, it's going to happen. Uh, and, you know, what do you do, you know, on a personal level, what do you do? Well, I don't know, you get out of debt, and you, you know, get out of things that are going to crash in the stock market and you try, try to get into things that are in a, in a defensive mode, you know, and, you know, we, we sell newsletters about that. And, uh, you know, will, will we change the ethic? Well, I actually think, I actually think that when the bombs start falling, which they are, and the missiles start shooting, which they are, and the jets start screaming, which they are, um, I think that some of the adults in the room turn to the kids in the room and say, okay, you've had your fun. Get the hell out of here. You know, go away. Get the hell out of here. You screwed it up. Time for the serious people to take over. And, uh, and I don't mean, you know, Napoleon on his white horse is going to ride in. Uh, but I do think that, um, I, I do think that, that as a, as a society and as a, as, 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 as a, as a functioning entity that wants to keep functioning, wants to keep the lights on, wants to keep food on the shelves, wants to keep, you know, uh, people, you know, have people be able to buy new shoes when they need new shoes. You know, I think the adults are going to, are going to have a, there's going to be a resurgence of adultism in the world. You know, a lot of the things that we think are important, uh, we're going to look at and say, this, this is all crap. You know, this is not, this is not that important. You know, uh, I'm being really polite here. I'm really being polite, you know, <laughs> and there are a lot of things that we look at in our universities and in our culture and in our, you know, in our Twitterverse and everything, we're going to look at that and say, this is all crap, you know, and uh, it's time to get serious. And so it's, it kind of brings us back to what we talked about at the very beginning, you know, uh, you know, Zelensky's over there trying to run a country 
and the country is getting is getting a, getting a tar bombed out of it, and they got Russian tanks and Russian troops and Russian, you know, uh, you know, hypersonic missiles crashing into places and blowing blowing things up, and you know, um, yeah, it's 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 time to put aside all the childish things and start to act like an adult. So I, so you know, it's kind of like what I think going back to Winston Churchill said, you know, the Americans will always do the right thing. Uh, in the end, after they've tried everything else, you know. <laughs> well, that sounds like a good place to wrap it up, Byron. I want to thank you for uh, for joining me. It's always a pleasure to to talk to you, and uh, I'm going to keep tabs on what you're writing so that I can uh, uh, follow up. Mostly, I I always follow you on the rare earth stuff, so mm-hmm. keep doing that. Well, thanks, yeah, thank you. I'll um, yeah, I'm 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 out and about. And I'm doing things, and uh, like I said, I'm in. I'm on a bit of a kind of a working trip right now. So I might, I might not be writing all that much in the next, you know, week or two, but, uh, but I, I've, you know, I'm following everything and we will, we, we will check back in, but I truly appreciate the ability to talk with you, Addison. Thank yep. you. And, and to the viewers out there, I, I really appreciate that you follow Addison and uh, that you're at all interested in, you know, what, what we have to say. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Byron.